Okay. Fine. Um, so, uh, in, to, in today's uh, today's lecture, we're going to try to look at what what we call the unoriented string. Now, um, I can't remember if we've discussed orientation reversal before. Can you? Can somebody remember? Have we discussed this in the class? Okay. So, so let's do that. Let's first start with the closed string. Okay. So let's start with the closed bosonic string. Okay. So as usual, the um, we have 1 by 4 pi alpha prime, d2 sigma, del x, del x. OK. Now, as you remember, um, we can think of this on a cylinder. And the cylinder, uh, the cylinder goes from uh, uh, the, the, there's a sigma coordinate here and a tau coordinate here. And sigma belongs to 0 to 2 pi. Everything is periodic under, uh, under t 0 to 2 pi. OK? Now, this theory is invariant under parity flip. The parity flip is basically sigma goes to minus sigma. OK? This theory is clearly invariant under that. Now, what we're going to do is to spend uh, two minutes trying to uh, see uh, what, how this parity flip acts on, uh, on the mode oscillator, uh, the mode expansion. And it is not in tau. What? Uh, we could do it also in tau, but I'm choosing not to. You this, this, this action is invariant under tau. What? This action is d sigma d tau. And then uh, d sigma d tau, it's just. Eta is cross. Uh, the, yeah, yes. sigma ca co contracts only with sigma. Okay. Right? Like a pa uh, parity transformation, take x to minus x without taking t to minus t. Mm -hmm. The usual parity symmetry of, of, uh, uh, of simple theories, of parity invariant theories. There's a parity invariant there. Okay. Now, let's look at this in terms of oscillators. Okay. So the oscillator expansion went like this. Uh, I won't get all the two pi's and i's and so on, right? But uh, at least schematically, we had x is equal to x naught, okay? Uh, plus um, some number times p naught times tau. If you press me, we can get this number right, okay? Uh, plus, and then there were two sums. Uh, this is the important part. Uh, so this n is equal to one to infinity. There were the there was the left moving and the right moving part. Okay, so there was alpha n. Um, n is equal to uh, one to infinity. So let's write it uh, uh, n and minus n. So alpha n. Okay, let's say minus infinity to infinity n not equal to zero. Okay, there was alpha n e to the power i n, and uh, now. Um, uh, e to the power i n, and uh, there was sigma plus tau, let's say tau plus sigma, maybe with a minus, and plus uh, n not equal to uh, 0 minus infinity to infinity, e to the power minus i n, tau minus sigma. Uh, these were alpha, alpha n. Twizzles. Okay, uh, positive n were uh, um, uh, annihilation operators, negative n were creation operators, and uh, mm, the usual story, right? Uh, positive n have positive frequency, which was e to the power minus i, uh, minus i e t. Okay, excellent. This was a mode expansion. Now, what happens under sigma goes to minus sigma? Well, it's totally clear. If you go to, uh, uh, if sigma goes to minus sigma, alpha, alpha, goes, to alpha, alpha. goes to alpha tilde. This is, of course, totally clear. One guy is going left, one guy is moving left, the other guy is moving right. But if you switch sigma, you switch left and right. Okay? So under parity transformations, omega on alpha n is equal to alpha tilde n action of omega. 
omega alpha and omega inverse, you know, the operator action on uh, omega is alpha minus n and omega uh, on alpha tilde n is equal to alpha n. And uh, because omega acts only in sigma, it does not touch the zero mode. Okay, so this is a very simple operation, just simple parity operation on a free scalar field. That is an invariance of this of this theory. Okay, so we've got an invariance of the theory. So what? Okay, now the point about this is the following. What we're going to try to do is to gauge the theory by this invariance. Okay. Uh, what we're going to try to do is to gauge the theory by this invariance, by which I mean we're going to only allow states in the theory that are invariant under this, this transformation. I'm going to impose the condition that omega on state has to be equal to 1. We're only going to only physically parity invariant. Oh, uh, the, 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 uh, what, what the orientation, yeah, parity invariant. Ome uh, one, only those states which are projected to 1 by omega. So in the trace, for instance, when we write down a trace, we will add a 1 plus omega by 2. Okay, Very much like the GSO projection was gauging the theory with respect to some other symmetry, namely fermion number. Is this clear? So this is the thing we're going to try to do. So now there are two things that I'm going to uh, uh, that I'm going to uh, well. Firstly, of course, this is going to this is going to have some sort of uh, impact on the spectrum. So let's work it out first for the bosonic string. First, in the bosonic string, there's a tachyon, but under uh, ori this orientation. Sorry, I started a bit earlier than this. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, under this, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the orientation pres uh, uh, preservation. Uh, under the orientation operation, identity goes to identity, so the tachyon is invariant. Okay, so uh, gauging by this doesn't help us with the tachyon; doesn't remove the tachyon. Okay, uh, but in the closed string, there was alpha, uh, there was alpha minus one mu, and alpha tilde minus one nu. Uh, that was the uh, that was the the states corresponding to the uh, the massless. Uh, um, uh, vertex operators, the graviton, the dilaton, and the beam medium. Okay, so this uh, uh, under, uh, under this, what happens? Well, what we do? So suppose you take this and put a zeta mu nu. Clearly, zeta goes to zeta transpose because alpha and alpha tilde are interchanged under parity. Is this clear? Therefore, those states which have symmetric zeta are preserved by this parity operation, by this omega or orientation reversal sometimes people call it operation. Whereas those states which have anti-symmetric zeta are projected out. Now symmetric zeta was what? Graviton and delton. Anti-symmetric zeta was what? Ramon. Ramon. So uh, in the orientation modded out, the, the, the bosonic string modded out, the un what's sometimes called the unoriented bosonic string. Okay, the massless sector has a graviton, and the massless sector has a um, has a dilaton, but it doesn't have a beam nu field. Okay, now there is an interesting. Uh, we'll get to this kind of way of thinking a little later in our discussions, but there is an interesting uh, um, reason for that. There is an interesting space-time reason for that, and let me explain that to you. Um, you see, uh, why, why in a theory with, when you've got a gauge field, you've got associated conserved charges, okay? And uh, uh, this is true even when you've got a, uh, when you've got an anti-symmetric two-form field, this B minimum. Now, in ordinary sonic string or in the ordinary type two string, what is the associate, associated conserved charge um, associated with the B field? Well, this is what you do. You know, let's remember how we have an how we have a conserved charge 
uh, associated with, uh, with, an, uh, with an ordinary gauge field. Suppose I have a particle that carries the charge. What you can do is take the weld line of the particle and surround it by a sphere. Okay, so suppose we're in D dimensions. We're in D dimensions. We can take the weld line of the particle and surround it by a sphere. And you want to measure the charge. Well, what you want to do is to measure E dot ds, right? The electric field. But what was this E dot ds? Well, E was um, uh, E was this. Suppose I take the field strength. Okay, so so imagine first we're in four dimensions. So this guy is going in time. Okay, and you're surrounded by a sphere in space. Right, exactly. So what you want is the RT component of the field strength. Del R of A0 is the electric field. Okay, but what you're going to be integrating over is a two sphere. So how do you do that? You do it by taking star. Okay, so what you do is to take star of f and integrate it over the sphere that, uh, that surrounds this particle. Now we work that out in four dimensions, but it actually works in every dimension. Because f is a two form. Star of f therefore is a d minus two form. And exactly we want to integrate over a d minus two sphere. So in every dimension, a good measure of the, um, uh, a, a good way of describing what the, the charge of our particle is, okay, is to take uh, a, st a star of f and integrate it over the, the d minus 2 sphere surrounding our particle. Now, uh, why is this thing, uh, uh, why is this thing conserved? Well, you can show by Maxwell's equations that it's conserved. Right? Fine. Similarly, if you've got a two-form field and it uh, obeys a Maxwell-type equation, you know, it comes from the Lagrangian dB, the whole thing squared in space-time. Um, similarly, you, could, you, you can show that if you've got a sphere surrounding some uh, and s d minus 3, as long as the equation is charge free, the equation that comes from d, b, the whole squared, but not b interacting with the source, okay, this charge is conserved. However, you know, a 3 minus, uh, uh, an s d minus 3 form, okay, uh, sorry, so and what, 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 what do you want to do, with, what do you want to integrate over this? You take d, b and take it star. And integrate this over the uh, over the s d minus three. B was a two form. D B was a three form. So uh, star of s uh, of d B is a d minus three form, perfect to be integrated over d minus three sphere. Okay. But where do we get a, th a d uh, you know an s d minus three? Imagine that we have a string. In our theory. So that string now occupies two dimensions in space, for instance. It, uh, sorry, it space occupies time. in space time. So it, it goes in time and occupies one dimension in space. So now what we want to do is to take the world sheet of the string and think of that as, as follows. Imagine that we are in R D and we take the world sheet to, sp to spread over two dimensions. So this thing now is a point in R d minus 2. And therefore, the, the sphere that surrounds it is an S d minus 3. Okay, so if you've got a string world sheet, just like a line can link with a d minus 2 sphere. Okay, just like a line can link with a d minus 2 sphere, a sheet can link with a d minus 3 sphere. Okay, and you can compute this charge for the, for, for the point particle. You could compute this charge 
Okay, you could compute this charge wherever wherever you took the the sphere. You could take it big or small. You could take it up or down. The fact that you take it up or down, you get the same answers. That's conservation of charge. Okay, and the reason the charge is conserved is that this particle line cannot break. You can't have a line here and then another line here. That would violate conservation of charge. Charge cannot, cannot just disappear, right? It would not in the consistent theory. Okay. Great. Now, suppose we had a particle line that went up and then down. Something like this. That would be like an electron and a positron. That would be charge zero. So you could still measure this thing, but you would get zero. Okay. Very good. So now, the point of this B field in string theory is that there is the fundamental string of string theory. The fundamental string of string theory, it has a coupling to the, its world volume couples to the B field through, an, uh, through a coupling like B integrated over the world volume. Again, there's so much left to tell you about. This we have to see in some way. We've not discussed this, right? We've not discussed the sigma model action. I, I, we will. We'll go through it all. It may take another year, but we'll go through it all. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the B field couples to the string world volume like this. Okay? Which tells you that the string world volume is charged under the B field. And the coupling is governed by the wave of the electron? No, this coupling is just, no, it's just integral dB. It's just integral B. So the, st no, the string has charge one under this B field. Just like, yeah, you know, this Dirac quantized kind of charge. Okay. Um, now, um, this tells you that the fundamental string of strings here is the thing that's, that's charged under the B field. Okay. And it's this fundamental string that whose charge you measure by taking this SD minus 3 and integrating over, um, oh, 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 yeah, oh, oh, over the sphere. But you know, there's something that's very important, and that's this. Strings, unlike particles, have a direction. Yeah. A string going this way carries some charge, whereas a string going that way carries the opposite charge. Charge carries a space. Yeah, right. A charge here is a vector, essentially, right? And you can see that these two carry the opposite charge from the fact that a string going this way, you can loop back. It's clearly nothing. Because you can take your three spheres surrounding it, move it here, and shrink to zero. So it had better be that a string going this way and a string going that way carry zero charge. But you see, the point is that in an unoriented theory, you're identifying the string going that way with the string going that way. Okay? And so this carries no charge. So oh, I said it a bit, bit, okay, this is a bit, bit rough. Say in light cone gauge, where you identify sigma with space. Okay? So it shouldn't be that in the R oriented theory there is a gauge field for the string because it should be like an uncharged string because there's no arrow associated with the string. And we see that very nicely from the fact that B is actually projected out of the spectrum. It would have been a bit odd if there was a, a gauge field and nothing charged under that gauge field. Okay? So the fact that B is projected out of the unoriented theory is basically the statement that strings are uncharged in this type C, uh, in, this, uh, in this unoriented theory. Okay? So that's a physical interpretation of this fact. Okay, fine. Now let's keep going. Now, why did I bring up this unoriented theory? I brought up the unoriented theory because I wanted to tell you about uh, about the torus partition function. You are saying all closed strings are chargeless. All closed strings, yeah. The, the string, the type, the string in type one theory does not carry any charge of any sort. Just think of it as a bit this way and a bit that way. It's just Only in the unoriented, the normal oriented theory, it carries a charge. Of course, every closed loop of a string carries no charge. It carries charge dipole. Just like an electron positron carries zero charge, but carries dipole moment. Okay? But an infinite string or a string winding a circle carries genuine charge in the oriented string theory, but carries no charge in the unoriented theory. 
OK? Excellent. Let's keep going. So. Oriented was oh, the, the one where you identify this way with that way. OK. So which charge will you associate? This one or that one? Zero, right? <laughs> it better be that since there's ambiguity of direction, it shouldn't carry a charge. A closed string wrapping a circle, is that the one? OK. So you see, what actually carries a charge? So normal closed string that loops on itself doesn't carry a charge. It's like a dipole. But if you want to really to carry a charge, either the string's infinite, or more realistically, there's a space-time circle, and the string wraps the circle. Then it carries a genuine charge, a winding number charge. OK? And winding number one is different from winding number minus one. OK? We will see other indications very soon of how this unoriented string theory does not carry a charge. We will see that in the unoriented string theory, closed strings can break. So in unoriented theory, w is only 0, the only allowed value. Or, or uh, winding number is not a conserved theory. charge because strings can break. Okay. You know, you can take a configuration like this, but if you can just then smoothly relate it to nothing, there's no conserved charge associated with that. Okay? Uh, we'll see how that works. Basically, we'll see that an unoriented theory is inconsistent unless it also has an open string sector. And then the closed string can break into an open string. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay. But, uh, uh, right? It's a higher order effect, right? Uh, it's, it's a higher order effect, exactly. But it's only permissible because there is no conserved charge. If there was a conserved charge, any order effect would allow, would, would preserve it. OK. Uh, but let's keep going. At the moment, what we want to do is to compute the analog of the torus partition function. Uh, at the moment, what we want to do is to compute the analog of the torus partition function um, uh, for our theory. Now, uh, before, before actually doing the computation, the computation is very easy. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> before actually doing the computation, um, uh, there, there is a, a little bit of geometry that is useful to keep track of. Okay. See, when I want to do the calculation, what I'll do is compute trace 1 plus omega divided by 2. So the torus is going to be replaced by doing this computation with, with this projector. Okay. Now, as usual, what we'll do is break this up into trace half plus trace omega by 2. This is the kind of trick we used a lot while doing the minus 1 to the s, right? OK? Each of these will have its own path integral representation. Half is what we've already computed. It's just the usual torus partition function. What about this guy? OK? So what about this guy? This guy is sort of interesting. Let's give it a geomet. First thing I want to do is to understand it geometrically. Okay? So um, the way I'm going to understand this geometrically is this. This a torus can be thought of as this rectangle. I have this object, and uh, I have this object, and uh, we've got ide uh, we've got identifications for the for the torus like this. This side is identified with this side. And this side is identified with this side. OK? But now what, what about this, this partition function? In this partition function, what we're supposed to do is to, before we identify, do an orientation flip. So one representation for the Klein bottle is this quantity. It's this, this. This, this. Yeah, this, this, this object is, has a name. It's called a Klein bottle. When you do, it's like a torus. But this and this are identified after an orientation flip. Okay. Now, there's one little manipulation that I'd like to do with this object because it'll prove useful for us in two minutes.
And that little manipulation is take this object and cut it here. I mean, not really cut it. But this object is the same thing as, imagine I've cut in the middle. OK? And now I do something a little odd. This is identified with this. I don't really want to cut, so I'll just put a third arrow, a second arrow, and identify these two. Since I've identified this, then I'm not cut. OK? But this guy was identified with that guy, right? Now we're getting a running out of <laughs> numbers of arrows. <laughs> okay? It is the opposite way in the previous picture, so let's do it that way. Okay? And this guy, oh, sorry, it's identified with that guy. Is this clear? Now, imagine taking this, turning it around in your mind, you know, if I could pick out this part of the blackboard, then flip it around and put it back on the blackboard. And then attaching this to this. It will be again in the rest. Wait, 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 be careful, be careful. Let, let's, let's do it carefully and then we'll see. What will we get? Then this side smoothly attaches to that. So I can just double the length. Yeah. So take this object here, flip it. Reflection. Yeah, reflect it. To pick no, it out of. Rotate or reflect? No, 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 reflect. So pick it out of the blackboard, turn it around, and stick it back on the blackboard. Yeah, reflection. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now take this and attach it here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm doing that because I want this to match to this. Yeah. Sure. Once I've got this, this is just smooth. Yes. And then this is what Shubham was saying. He was saying that, look, this now matches this because of the, the flip. So it looks like we're going to get a torus, but not quite. Because as Sunil is saying, there's this and there's this. These are not identified. They are not identified. And moreover, something odd is happening because half of this circle is identified with half of the, with the other half. Okay, so let's think of this. So this is like a. Imagine that we've got a circle here. I mean, this is a circle because this end is identified with this end. Some S one mod B two. Ah, B2. this is exactly opposite ends of the circle are identified. Right? If you're here, that's identified with here. Okay, this thing is denoted by this object here, which is sometimes called a cross cap. So what this is, it's a cylinder with opposite ends of the circle identified. Okay, so this is like a cylinder, except that it's got these two cross caps, and it's going like this. Okay, so this Klein bottle, is equivalently a cylinder with two cross caps, one at the end. A normal cylinder just has some boundary conditions at these two ends. This doesn't have boundary conditions, it's not got open strings, but it's got something odd at the boundaries. Like this identification with, uh, with the flip of half. Is this clear? Okay. Now, you see, this is not the same as making it a circle twice half the length. Because it's not true that in the bulk, fields have to be periodically identified with, ha with half. In the bulk, the only identification you need to make is this with this. So the bulk fields are identified with length 2L. On the boundary, they are identified with length L. So it's not like saying that it's just a cylinder but with half the length. It's just a, a cylinder with, with the actual length, but with funny boundary conditions. Is this clear? Okay? It's like what goes in here comes out here. Right? This thing doesn't really have a boundary at these two ends. Because you think you're hitting a boundary, but no, you're coming out here. This guy doesn't really have a boundary here. 
You think you're hitting boundary, but you're coming out here. Is this clear? It's a funny object. Uh, like, like you would see here, in, in this way, you know, you've seen drawings of these climb bottles, right? <laughs> this goes beyond my geometric <laughs> conception. Uh, but you can see from that point of view, it's not a shape with a boundary. It's a torus, then a twist, I mean, whatever, orientation reversal, and then, then joining. It's no boundary. Even here, it has no boundary, but it's got some funny stuff here. Okay, this representation is going to be useful. Uh, let's just pretty, let's just, just anticipate. The anticipation is this. Well, once we do our calculation, we're going to cut it like this. And we'll see stuff running between these two. These two Klein bottles, very much like we did for open strings in, yes, in Tuesday's lecture. Let's see how that goes. Okay? So let's 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 now get to the calculation. Calculationally, all we need to do is to compute this object here. Let's first do it for the bosonic string. Okay. Uh, calculationally, all we need to do is to compute this object here. So what do we do? Well, let's see. Um, look, what was the Hilbert space of the bosonic string? The Hilbert space of the bosonic string was the Hilbert space. So, so what we want to do, of course, is to compute uh, trace. Uh, is it true that this lower line is identified with the upper line? Yes. Uh, That's what these three arrows are no, saying. That is true, but this small line. This one? This one is identified with this. Which small lines? These two arrows. Like. Sorry, I'm not understanding. This is identified with this, this with this, and this with this. Previously, this was identified with this one. Which one? This arrow is identified with this. Correct. One, right? Now also this is true. That this, this is not even there. Yeah. This is a, on the boundary. This is identified with this, and this is identified ah. with this. Right? Because this is now smooth. Yes. Yes. But in the middle, there is an identification. The, uh, no, there's nothing happened. The, you see, any point is identified with itself. This point, are you asking whether it's this not is identified? This is identified with this? On the no. On the side, boundary. On the side yes. Everything on the side it is. On the side, any point here is identified with half shift. With half shift. Okay. This nothing special about this point. Yeah. You, know, you should imagine it yeah. rotated. Right? So any point here is identified with it. But in the middle, it's just normal space. Just I go on, go on. This, this point identified with this point. Yeah, correct. And this point is also identified with this point. Correct. Then how, I mean, yeah. there, there is a... This point and this point are the same. Yes. Oh, okay. Imagine that you've got a circle. What we said is that this and this are identified. Uh -huh. Now you think this is also identified with this, but that's the same thing. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Right? The only reason, had it been that we had could draw this identification everywhere in the bulb, it would have just been a circle of half the length. Yes, yes. But the fact that it's happening only at the boundary and not in the bulk mm. makes it not a circle of half the length. Mm. So you have a cylinder and you pinched up two sides. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And in the bulk, it is free. Exactly, exactly. It's something like that. Right? But the pinching off is in a strange way. You know, because what what... If you imagine a mode, you've got a guy going out, it goes and hits this. For the open string, what would happen? The boundary conditions would make it reflect. What would happen here? It would come out here. Yes. It's an odd thing. Okay? Okay, excellent. Um, so let's keep going. So now what we want to do is to compute this trace. So we want to compute this trace of... Uh, yeah. Now, uh, now you see, because we are going to be identifying left with because this omega I flips left and right. It flips L0 and L0 bar. 
right? Because L0 is made up of the left oscillators, L0 bar is made up of the right oscillators, okay? So it will only receive contributions from those states in which L0 is equal to L0 bar, right? Because uh, we'll see this very clearly in a minute. I'll write it out very clearly, but uh, uh, intuitively that's clear. So this tells you yeah, that that instead of you know for a normal torus, what we do is q to the power l zero, q bar to the power l zero bar. We uh, we take a trace like this, okay? Because l zero has to be equal to l zero bar, the only kind of a uh, partition function that is going to be sensible is just e to the power i uh, to pi t l0 or l0 bar, l0 plus l0 bar, let's call it. Right, I mean, there's no, basically there's one chemical potential, not two, because l0 and l0 bar are the same. Very much like it was for the case of the, case of the open string. Right, in the case of the open string, we only had one chemical potential. There because the left and the right were not independent, because left reflected into right. Similarly here, left is identified with the right. So we have only one chemical potential. Okay, so very much like for the case of the open string, this is the kind of, this is the kind of partition function we're going to try to compute here. In fact, uh, if you ask a mathematician, what is the moduli space of a torus, of a Klein bottle? You'll say it's one real dimension. Unlike a torus, which is one complex dimension. It's like a cylinder because this identification is not compatible with one of the moduli of the torus. It's the sigma modulus there. Again, it's, it's, it's like a rectangular kind of thing that, 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 that is allowed. Okay, so this is the kind of quantity we're going to compute just like we did, I mean we did something very similar for the, uh, for the open string. Okay, so now let's, let's do this computation. So we want to trace e omega by two of this object. This is the, the object we want. Now, what is the Hilbert space of our, um, uh, of, our, of our string? Well, there's the zero mode sector, which is totally unaffected by anything we're talking about. Zero mode sector lies in L0 plus L0 bar. So it's gonna be exactly what it was for the ordinary torus. And then there is the left moving sector and the right moving sector. Now, omega acts on the oscillators. So the most general state in the, in the Hilbert space was labeled by some momentum, which came from the zero mode. Uh, some oscillator number. And some uh, left moving oscillator number, left moving oscillator number for, for the guy with frequency one, the guy with frequency two, the guy with frequency three, that's why I've written this curly, funny curly bracket. Bunch of integers for it, labeled by integers. N1, N2, N3, N4. Okay, and similarly n tilde for the for the, the 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 other guys. Now, how does omega act on the space? It flips n and n tilde. Now, what is a trace? So, trace is p n n tilde, then e to the power minus uh, ah. Sorry, there's no i here. There's a minus because q was e to the power i. Right, so uh, just like for the open string, minus two pi L zero uh, plus L zero. And now the action of omega flips these two as you, as you guys explained to me, so P N tilde and then. Now the Hamiltonian commutes with project, uh, with, you know, Hamiltonian on this gives me some number times this. But these are an orthogonal basis. So unless n tilde is same as n, we'll get zero contribution. Is this clear? Okay, is this completely clear? Unless n tilde is exactly the same as n, we get no contribution at all. Okay, so now what do we get? What we get here is L0 is equal to L0 bar. So it's exactly like having one sector of the string because n tilde is equal to n tilde bar, but with t replaced by 
2t. Is this clear? Okay. So now this is basically identical to the open string calculation, except that t is 2t. Okay. And so now what is the answer? What did we get from the from the open strings? Well, from the open string, what we got was one over eta of uh, i t. This will become eta of two i t. Okay, and then we got one over t to the power d by two. D will be ten for the super string, twenty six for the bosonic string. That's why I'm writing d by two. Okay, and uh, and then as usual, the B C will get rid of one of these factors. So this thing here was uh, to the power d by two, and it'll become d by two minus one. Okay, as usual, we'll make this d by two minus one, and this will become d t by t squared. One factor of the uh, of the zero mode part will go into the into the measure. Is this clear? Okay, and uh, uh, now we'll get also halves. Okay, but there is one normalization here that I have so far ignored that will now become very important. Please go. Please go. Please go on. Uh, how is this condition uh, different from the label matching condition? Because I mean, on the looks of it, uh, it uh, seems to require that uh, on each of the levels, uh, n tilde has to equal n. Level, yeah. by level matching tells you hmm. that the total level of the left movers is the hmm. total level of the right movers. This condition is telling you that the st state by state is equal. Okay, so it's very different. This cuts down the degree, much stronger. Clear? Okay, excellent. So far our calculations have been very rough because we've not kept track of overall normalizations. And that's because we didn't need them. But now, as you're going to see, we're going to be interested in trying to cancel the bad thing that happened with open strings against an equivalent bad thing that happens with other unoriented strings. This is going to be our game. And because of that, we're going to have to keep factors more carefully. Okay? Because we're going to be interested in the numerical coefficient behind our... You, you remember we had a, an integral dt. Oh, let me first show you that we're getting something similar here. The, the, uh, it's totally trivial. It's once again we do the S duality on the. Uh, 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 okay. Right. Once again we use this 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 property. The property was t to square root square root t times eta of i t is equal to eta of uh, i by t. this property that we used last time. Okay? We will use this and up to factors of 2, which will turn out to be now very important. What, what, what? Is t times eta I t is equal to eta i by 2? No, no. This is, this is correct. Let us remember, the, the equation was square root t times mod eta squared. Oh, uh, mod eta squared. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, yes. Went with 1 by square root t. And then we took square root of that. Uh, and then we put the t there. This is the one that was useful for the, for the open strings, right? Okay. So once again, we're going to use this. And we'll be carefully look at factors of 2 in 2 minutes. But ignoring the factors of 2, then once again, we get an eta of i t. Once again, now we've got this module, this integration dt goes from 0 to infinity. 
as usual, if we are working in a theory, we the uh, um, uh, as usual, if we are working in a theory with uh, um, uh, with no uh, 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 if we are working in the, it's in the original theory so before we did the s duality, if there was no e to the power uh, plus s plus t thing, so if we include everything, include the uh, the fermions and include the GSO projection, okay, the behavior at very large values of t will be good. So the IR behavior is good, just like for the open strings, just like for the cylinder. The danger is at small values of t, okay. For the small values of t, we had to do this flip exactly as for the, for the cylinder, dt by t squared becomes ds. This becomes eta of s and the fact that there was no tachyon tells you there's no e to the power plus s. But the fact that there are massless states tells you that there is a constant term, okay? And that constant term once again will give you the, give you trouble. Now our game is going to be cancelling terms against each other, okay? For that reason we need to keep the relative factors between these constant terms very carefully, okay? Now there are two sources of relative factors. The first source is that when I said that this was t to the power d minus 2, I was being very rough, okay? So let's go back and look at that carefully, okay? So let, where did this t to the power d minus 2 come from? It came from the zero mode path integral. Zero mode path integral is very simple because it's quantum mechanics. Okay? So let's first work out the zero mode path integral more carefully. Zero mode path integral. And let's first do for the open strings. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, we have one over uh, one over two pi alpha prime, but now this string runs from zero to pi. So after doing the integral, we get one over two alpha prime uh, x zero dot square. Okay. So now this is the same thing as uh, so. Sorry, we had one over four pi. So we had one over four pi. Our, our action was 1 over 4 pi alpha prime. So we have 1 over 4 alpha prime. So this is a particle with mass, a non-relativistic particle, with mass is equal to 1 over 2 alpha prime. Okay, so the partition function for this theory, okay, over some length t or 2, 2 pi t or whatever it is, since it's only relative factors, okay, but in minus 2 pi t times p squared by 2m, this is 2 alpha prime p squared. Doing the Gaussian integral over this gives us a factor of the square root of t, but it gives us more precisely 1 over square root of 2 pi t, 2 alpha prime. And then there are other pi's. Yeah. Well, who cares about that? We're just caring about relative factors. Okay? So in particular, all these factors will be common, but the two will not, okay? So forget about all the common factors, okay? We'll just get the, keep the mass, okay? So 2t. So the thing with the open strings, each term came with a 1 over square root of 2t. Is this clear? As far as the zero mode was concerned, the unoriented string, as far as the, as the zero mode was concerned, uh, the unoriented string was just like the oriented string, okay? So it's zero mode path integral is the same as this except the mass is one over alpha prime because the zero, you do the two integral pi. with two pi. So one over four pi times two pi. So 1 over 2 alpha prime, but 1 over 2 m, okay? So 
So with the 1 over alpha prime, this extra factor of 2 is not there. Okay. So for open strings, we got this for orient unoriented. We get 1 over square root of t. Is this clear? Is this clear? All good? No, open string was 0 to pi. Closed string was 0 to 2 pi. That's the only difference. So let me do it more clearly. Here, th this action will be 1 over 2 alpha prime x0 dot square. So we go through this whole thing. This will be e to the power minus. Yeah. Clear? Closed strings, zero mode structure has nothing to do with the unoriented or the oriented. Nothing, nothing to do. It, it would have been the yeah, same I mean, 1 over square root t. I mean, just the zero mode path integral. Just the zero mode path integral is totally unaffected by being oriented or yeah. In the zero mode sector, it's just no effect. Yeah. Is this clear? Okay. This is one difference. The second difference came from using this S duality. I, I, mean, I mean, I don't think S duality is the st standard term for this. It's just t goes to 1 by t. Mm. Okay? You see, so what did we have here? What we had, so now let's be careful. In the case of the open string, in the denominator, what did we have? We had t to the power d by 2. Okay? Times eta of i t and then there was extra factor square root. So, uh, 2t d by 2. So, open string, we had 1 over this. All good? Uh, eta of i t to the power d. Clear? For the unoriented string, U O S, unoriented string, we have 1 over e to the power d by 2, because that's this, and eta of 2 i t. Okay? Sorry. Ha hello? Okay, I'll come back. I'm, I'm teaching. I'm teaching now. I'll stop in 10, 15 minutes and we'll come. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because of his match. It's total madness. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll come soon. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Sorry, people. In about 10 minutes, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to go. Um. Okay. Um. Okay, but let's finish this. Okay, so so where were we? So there was this and there was this. Now, in order to understand wha what happens as we go near, uh, and remember we had dt by t, dt by t, dt by t. Yeah, sorry, what were you saying? No, no, I mean uh, near t. Uh, and in one case, this would be, okay, yeah, dt by t wouldn't be affected. Uh, no, not, uh, not affected, yeah. yeah. Actually, both of them have a half, because we are computing half of something. Mm. Not that that matters, because they all have halves. Okay, but fine. Okay. Now, we do this, this S duality. So this makes it 1 over... This, that, that S duality operation leave, leaves us with, so ignore this half, it's just irritating. Okay, so this is dt, um, hmm. now this becomes, sorry, this was uh, eta uh, d minus 
do effectively after we get rid of the ghosts. Ghosts had no zero modes. Um, so there was no zero mode part from that. Just the oscillator part was, was removed. So this is the kind of integral that we have to do. Okay, now what are we left with? First, we're left with 2t squared, because 1, 2t came out here. Okay, then we're left with 1 over 2 to the power d minus uh, 2 by 2. And then we just get 1 over e tau of i by t. Right? This becomes integral ds by 2 to the power to the power ds. Okay, this becomes ds by 2 and uh, um, uh, ds by 2 and then this becomes uh, 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 2 to the power d minus 2 by 2. So that's 1 over 2 to the power d, 2 to the power d basically. by 2, thank you, d by 2 times 1 over eta of i by t uh, d minus 2, uh, s, i s, d minus 2. Okay, and, um, and uh, uh, similarly what we get here, here we get um, dt by t squared, nothing happens here, but then in order to use this relationship, we need extra factors of 2. So we will get uh, dt by t squared, 1 by t, so I'll make it 2t to the power d by 2 minus 2, it of 2it, but I put that 2 by hand, so there is a 1 over 2 to the power d by 2 minus, minus 1. And you need 2 in the d by t And I need 2, uh, no, it's, it's just what it is. Yeah, the, the 2 that came here because there was an extra factor of 2 here. Here it's not there. Right? Ah, no, 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 no. That that uh, okay. Uh, okay, let's do it carefully. So so far, what we got is one over d by two minus one. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. You're probably yeah. Okay. So let's call. You say let's call two t equals s. Fine, let's do that. Let's call 2t equals s. So uh, this will come ds by s squared, but we need an extra 2. two. And this is in the upstairs. What? This number, so this is what d by 2 minus 1. Was upstairs? So Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was in the denominator of the <laughs> denominator. <laughs> to part d by 2 minus 1. Thank you. Uh, and you're saying, well, we'll put a 2 here and put an extra 2 here, yes. so it becomes 2 to the power d by 2, yes. and then it becomes ds, thank you, by s square, uh, but ds s square is not there, thank you, and this becomes 1 over eta of i by s, no, is. Yes. Lovely. To the power d minus 2. Okay, all great, all great. So what we see is that the, now, as you know, the large S behavior of this combined with the fermions and so on is going to give you a constant term, okay? But these two constant terms are very precisely related to each other. If this comes with, if we call this the constant in this integral, whatever it is, the, the infinity that we have, this comes with a factor of one over d by two, this comes with a factor of d by two. Okay. Now, unfortunately, they both come with the same sign. So it doesn't look like we're, we're going to be able to cancel them against each other. But still, somehow it looks like progress. Okay. 
at least we've got a bad bad thing here with a particular number we've got a bad thing here with a relative with another relative number which we can compute which we have completely precisely computed okay now what we're going to do is the following now what we're going to do is to, is to think a little bit you see actually we haven't done the calculation quite right because we allowed the open this closed string to be unoriented but when we did the open string calculation we were assuming it was an ori oriented open string so if we allow the closed string to be unoriented we must allow also the open string to be unoriented because locally the string swell sheet is the same so we have to redo the open string calculation okay once again in the open string sector what we're going to need is a half that's why I said everything in the same half actually when we did the open string it didn't have a half we're going to do a trace of half 1 plus omega by 2 oh, sorry okay. So the half, the cylinder diagram, is exactly what we talked about before, what we did last class. So we have to do that with the half. But we now need also the omega acting on the open string sector, trace of omega with the open string sector. That's another diagram we need. Right? So there is a fourth diagram we have to come. Well, uh, well there's the torus, which was great. That was the first diagram. Then there was the cylinder which is just a plain open string, which is this half. Then there was a Klein bottle, which we just computed. And finally, what we're going to need is uh, what people call the Mobius strip. Uh, okay, exactly. That will give us this guy. Now I'm going to have to go before, okay, I'll, I'll quickly just do the geometry and we'll do the calculation next time. By the way, uh, I didn't say it, but uh, the space-time interpretation of the infinity for the Klein bottle is exactly like we had before. You remember that there were two, we said that the reason that there was a problem with the open string is there's something here in space-time and something else here in space-time and closed strings are being exchanged. Well, the interpretation is that putting unoriented strings also fills all of space-time with a certain energy, really a charge for the dilaton. So once again, all, all the strings are being exchanged, including the dilaton, and that gives you the trouble. The point we're going to try to do is to somehow cancel these charges. If we can cancel the charges for the massless fields, in particular the dilaton, then we're in business. Okay, so we had a certain amount of energy from the open strings, certain amount of energy from this, but we haven't done the open strings right yet, because we need to include also the Mobius strip. Perhaps we can get a cancelling contribution from the Mobius strip. That's our hope. Is this clear? Okay. Uh, now, uh, I, I, I'm, going, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to work out the unoriented string with, for you in, in uh, next, next class. Uh, the, this, this Mobius strip diagram for you next, next class. It's an easy calculation. But uh, uh, the thing I wanted to show you just before we left was just the geometry of this Mobius strip. Okay, so what is the geometry of the Mobius strip? Well, all we have is an open string, which is there was a cylinder. So we had these two, um, you know, we had the cylinder, we had some Neumann boundary conditions at the cylinder, it's just some end of the cylinder. And then what we want is an open string identified like this. Right? So that's the Mobius strip. You, you go around and then you turn it around and join. Okay. But once again, I want to try to think of this uh, uh, in some funny way. So let me try. Once again, I cut it like this. So this is so this is equal to okay, and then this. Sorry, this was. Um, this guy, the end was this, and this guy was this. Now I play the same game. I turn this guy around and put it on top. Okay, so what do I get? What I get is top, top, 
Uh, what is this end edge? This end edge is just Neumann boundary conditions. Neumann boundary conditions here and here just join up smoothly. So there's nothing funny about this. This is a normal end of a cylinder. Normal end of a cylinder, twice the length. This is a cylinder. This is the cross cap. So, whereas the Klein bottle was two of these, mold with and, the and the cylinder was just this, this Mobius strip is like this. Okay. Because of this, this is sort of like a cross term, right? Hmm. So, we can already sort of guess what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that, by the way, here I did the calculation for one open string. Had there been n squared, had there been n Chan, Chan pattern factors, I would have got a factor of n squared. Just because there's a factor of n here and a factor of n there. Okay, uh, that, that, sorry, that factor would have been there. Here, n squared. So what we had is n square by 2 to the power d by 2 plus one, 2 to the power d by 2. Can anyone guess what will turn out in the middle? This is like a square. In. In. This is like b square. Yeah. This must be like 2ab. <laughs> I mean, clearly, right? <laughs> so, so what we're going to get is n by 2 to the power d by 2 uh, plus minus. Whether it's plus 2ab, minus 2ab, that you have to worry about. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 d by 4. D by 4 plus minus 2 to the d by 4. D to the power d by 4. Yes. Uh, square. Uh, something like this is going to work out, and then when if we get if we go in luck and we get the minus sign, and then if n is equal to two to the power d by two, then it's zero. <laughs> okay, that's how it's going to work. Okay, so for uh, uh, d, uh, d is equal in the superstring. When d is 10, this 30 is SO 32. 32. Why SO? I'll tell you. But the gauge group will be ranked 32. For the bosonic string, it's SO 8192. Yeah, 2 to the power 13, whatever that is, 8192. Which <laughs> 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 is good reason to believe the bosonic string does, doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay, we'll, uh, we'll work this out in detail. Uh, we'll work this out in detail tomorrow.